now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty of what Indians are all about. I still say we Indian people are believers in the truth. This is the way of life that was given to your people. You born an Indian, you're going to die an Indian. Indianness is a good life. You're facing an Indian this afternoon. Thursday, August 13th, 2020. Former Muscogee Creek Nation Principal Chief George Tiger was sentenced to one year and one day in federal prison, followed by a two-year probation and a $10,000 fine. On September 13, 2019, Mr. Tiger pled guilty to one count of bribery concerning programs receiving federal funds as part of a plea agreement with the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Oklahoma. In the agreement, Tiger outlines how, as the chairman of the Alabama Cassati Economic Development Authority Board, he accepted payments totaling $61,900 from Aaron Terry. According to Tiger, these payments were intended to influence or reward him in deciding ongoing or future business transactions of the tribal town. Tiger reports for custody on September 14th to begin his sentence in the Federal Medical Center, Fort Worth, an administrative security prison. I not only work as an advocate, but I speak as a survivor of domestic and sexual violence. I know how important the Muscogee Creek Nation Family Violence Prevention Program services are. We are here to advocate for you regardless of tribal citizenship, race, sexual orientation, or gender. Confidential support is available 24 hours a day. You are not alone. Together we can make a stand. Call today, 918-732-7979. Uh, my name is Kimmy Wind Hummingbird, and I am the Director of Children and Family Services for the Muscogee Creek Nation. I have worked in Indian child welfare for 21 years now, so it's my life's passion, and I truly can say that I wake up every morning excited about working with our children and our families. So we recently seen the passing of Tribal Resolution 2141 in an emergency session on July 30th. And that's a tribal resolution that authorizes the principal chief to execute an intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oklahoma regarding jurisdiction over Indian children within the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. Can you talk a little bit about that particular legislation and what it what it's designed to do? Of course. So it is a government to government agreement put in place for the protection of Indian children on our reservation. It's much like the cross deputization agreements that Light Horse has in place with other law enforcement agencies. It's for the protection of children. Okay. So does it like kind of allow you guys the different, so the agencies with the state can work with the, you know, tribal agencies for like child placement? Is that the idea? Yes, ma'am. And that has been longstanding. We have worked alongside the state of Oklahoma for many years in the placement of our Muscogee Creek children. Okay. Um, when, does it have any particular, um, you know, mechanisms as it pertains to children who are like citizens of the tribe? Like, what is it, what does this legislation do, like, can you kind of like walk us through it, like how the process works? Um, so the intergovernmental agreement allows for CFSA or the Muscogee Creek Nation to properly and responsibly handle the influx of cases that are involved with the Indian children, all of the Indian children on our reservation, because our codes speak to protection of all Indian children, just not Muscogee Creek children. So um, there is a need for us to build the infrastructure internally so that we can support um, that, that massive amount of Indian children that we would be um, working with. And is this the same piece of legislation that we saw come up like a week before, or was it was uh, July 21st, we saw TR 134. Are they the same pieces of legislation, basically? So they're very similar, but there is some, there was some language change, some verbiage change, and it's been explained to me that the major, mod the main modifications were um, the removal of, the first agreement mentioned the five civilized tribes, and it wasn't specific to the Muscogee Creek Nation. So the mm -hmm. second agreement um, that was put forth specifically speaks to the Muscogee Creek Nation, recognizing that um, 
the SCOTUS McGirt opinion was specific to Muscogee Creek Nation. Okay, yeah, kind of just like that, like, like ownership of this tribe's, you know, code kind of thing. Um, yes. Can you kind of talk about the importance of, uh, you know, TR-141, one, one the one that did pass through, it, and, and it went unanimously, right? Yes, ma'am, it did. So the importance of having that cooperative agreement with the state of Oklahoma is, I, I know I've said it multiple times already, is just to ensure the safety of all of the Indian children on our reservation as we can uh, move forward and build internally our programs. Um, they're, they're, we, we've been planning this since the um, Murphy opinion came out of the 10th Circuit in 2017. So we've been hoping for a favorable opinion and we're excited that, that we did get a favorable opinion. Yeah. Can you kind of give us an idea about how the relationship between tribal services and the Oklahoma foster services have worked in the past? Can you kind of just kind of outline how that functions? Yes. So our state reunification and permanency team is assigned to each case um, that the nation intervenes on and they participate in hearings and hearings regarding placement of Indian children or Muscogee Creek children across the state of Oklahoma. Our seven caseworkers and one program manager are assigned cases in 31 of the 77 counties across the state of Oklahoma. They're responsible for conducting home visits with all of our children in foster care as well as working closely with all the parties in the case and they make uh, community resource referrals for the families such as referrals to our behavioral health or for our WIC or for child care assistance and then of course for um, the families that live outside of our reservation we make other tribal service report uh, re referrals for them too for other tribes to utilize their services um, and then of course though as the global pandemic has taken shape across the state of Oklahoma, our program practices were modified to limit the exposure to COVID for our children and our families and our workforce. The safety and protection of our children is our utmost concern right now. Sure. And can you kind of, so that's kind of the broad overview of how the programs have functioned in the past. Um, what, is there anything specific that you can kind of pinpoint that's really going to be the, the changing thing since McGirt's happened? Like, is there any kind of developments that have kind of come along since the um, SCOTUS opinion? So right now, our response to children and families um, hasn't changed since prior to the opinion that was released on July 9th. We still have the same response to our, our families, we still have the same re response to our families. So at this point, nothing has changed. Okay. Um, can you kind of talk about like how many children the program or, you know, are, are affected by these intergovernmental agreements for Muscogee Creek Nation's area specifically? Sure, sure. So the number of children in care can fluctuate on a daily basis. Um, the data I received on July 9th was that there were 863 Indian children in DHS custody on our reservation. And of those 863 children, 236 of them were Muscogee Creek. Wow, okay. And can you kind of give us um, a, maybe a rundown on the important parts of the legislation that, that authorize this uh, government agreement? Is there certain parts of it that do specific things that you guys really need to happen? There are, yes. And first and foremost, I'd like to mention that in my conversations with several of the assistant attorney generals for the Muscogee Creek Nation, it has been made clear to me that this agreement does not waive the nation's sovereignty or give up any of the nation's jurisdiction. It goes hand in hand with the protection of our children and our protection of our sovereignty and our exclusive jurisdiction of Indian children on our, on our reservation. The document also discusses concurrent jurisdiction or shared jurisdiction and in no way gives any of the jurisdiction to the state of Oklahoma. So I just want to make sure that everyone's clear about that. This is this is not new to us. This is something that we have um, worked alongside the state of Oklahoma for many years, and not just the Muscogee Creek Nation. All the tribes in Oklahoma function this way alongside DHS. That's what I was going to kind of ask next. Is like, are those kind of have we had the have we had those kind of agreements before? Yes. Um, so the Muscogee Creek Nation has entered into tribal state agreements with the state of Oklahoma for quite some time. Our tribal codes already address and recognize the need for cooperative agreements. And the code was actually that speaks specifically to uh, cooperative agreements was enacted by NCA 
126 and approved on August 9th, 2001. Um, and so a, a you know, long run. It, it has. It's almost 20 years, almost. Yeah. Um, are there instances in the past which agreements facilitated that maybe a child's placed in the home quickly because of having that agreement? You know, does it like help expedite in any way um, that child being placed in, you know, where they need to be? Um, I don't know that uh, it affects that in that manner. Um, if a child is in imminent danger and in need of emergency foster care, there is never any delay in that child being protected or placed in emergency foster care. Um, our, our SRMP team has no hesitation to make recommendations to the court or DHS. And um, once the, the nation is a party, we stay involved in that case until um, permanency is achieved for that child. Okay. okay. Has there ever been in like any instances as, and we've had the like agreements in place for a while. This is a new one kind of in, in light of the new um, Supreme Court, you know, opinions, but has there ever been any in, instances where um, the tribe was, unable to step back into a case and advocate for those kids who um, were under tribal jurisdiction. Has that ever been an issue before? No, it hasn't. It has not. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, whenever our, uh, an SRMP worker is assigned a case, they have the case um, through the, the, until permanence is achieved through the reunification efforts or whatever is the next step for that family. Um, I don't know of a time that our, our SRMP unit has ever stepped back or stepped out of a case at any time. Okay. So with the agreements authorized by this legislation, would the tribal system still be able to step back into those cases, do whatever they need to do, even though they're working with the state under this tribal jurisdiction? Yes, ma'am. So there, there should not be a time that we would step out, but we would al always stay in and always be right there alongside with DHS. Okay. I was wondering that, um, you know, even before the McGirt uh, ruling, what was the role of um, the tribal child services and that, how has that played in the placement of Indian children? So, as I mentioned before, our SRMP team attends the court hearings and they make recommendations to the judge and the department for regarding placement of our children. Um, that's never really been... Um, some, that's something that we've, we've done for um, quite some time, and I don't imagine that, that role ever changing. We are always going to be in courtrooms advocating for our children and for our citizens and for what's best for our families. And, like, part of, uh, I'm assuming, because I'm gonna ha kind of playing guesswork, I don't know a whole lot about the, pro the, the program, but is part of that job, like, finding the foster families for those kids? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I've got like a series of questions about foster families. So I, I feel like that's kind of always like a hard thing to find. Has that been a, a increase or decrease in foster families over, you know, the last few years is where, where are we at right now? So I can tell you that in my 21 years of working in Indian child welfare, there has always been an absolute need for more Indian foster families. And that's just not an issue that we face in Old Mulvey, Oklahoma. That's an issue that they've, every tribe faces across the nation. Um, as I speak to other tribal child welfare directors, we all have the same issue within um, our, our programs is that we have to have more foster parents. We need foster parents. There's, there's not enough. How, how are you guys like getting, like what are some of the ways you have to get creative to find them and what are some of the barriers to finding them? So we do a lot of community outreach. Um, we set up resource booths at stomp dances, wild onion dinners, community events, and we also partner with DHS and do some um, recruitment activities with them. We host trainings and do events to raise awareness. And um, of course, during this global pandemic, we've had to use social media to recruit as well as our television commercials that ran. I was to say, I've seen you guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actively, we, we've got to be creative and think outside of the box and do everything we can to engage with our, um, with our, our communities and our citizens and uh, hope they'll recognize um, the need. Okay. Is there any, um, since we're on the topic, it's all, always a good time to like plug if anybody is thinking about, you know, being a foster, you know, family, what they should do, who they should contact. You want to just Absolutely. give them some info? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, 
please call us. I, and I can't tell you, I can't stress you the need. We, it is our job as a nation to stand up and protect our most vulnerable citizens, our abused and neglected children. Um, so if you're interested in being a foster parent, please call us. 918-732-7869. And you can ask to speak with Reagan Osborne or Robin Wins. And again, we're teleworking right now, so they might have to call you back, but please, please leave your name and number and they will get respond to you immediately. Um, we are doing everything we can to recruit as many foster homes as we can. So please, please, please hear our call, please. Okay. All right. Awesome. I, I, I've, I've seen people talking about it on social media, so I'm assuming that's great. You know, I've seen people encouraging other folks to, you know, if you can um, have a kid come to your house, then definitely try to try to be that kind of support. Is the um, tribe working towards uh, any major like improvements or increased capacity when it comes to you know working with in in the post you know SCOTUS opinion era here? Is there any like plans to increase staff or do more um, in that department of you know children and family services? Yes, so definitely. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we've been planning this since 2017. We do have um, some strategic plan going on. Um, it hasn't been uh, finalized and approved yet, but we do recognize that we are going to have to grow and we're going to have to grow quickly. And um, in addition to obtaining the qualified needed staff that we have to, to provide the services that we can to our families, we're also going to have to train them. So we recognize that... Um, we, we, there is going to be some building that needs to be, um, to be taking place, but we, we are, we're ready. We're ready to take this on. We're excited about this opportunity. We're so excited about the favorable opinion that came down and we're ready to move this forward. My intent is for us to be the most trauma informed, responsive child welfare, Indian child welfare team that we can be. So we're, we're looking forward. We're ready to step up to the challenge. It's going to take us some time to get there, but we will get there. We will. Awesome. That's great news. Um, I'm trying to envision, like, the, this legislation seemed like it was pretty imperative to get in place. Like, there was kind of some urgency to it. Um, is there, do you guys have any kind of feel as to whether or not there will, there will ever be a period where we don't have these intergovernmental agreements with the state of Oklahoma? Or is this the kind of standard for the operation everywhere? I mean, um, my intent, and in that I, I've said this in multiple times in multiple meetings, is we'll get there. This this agreement will be dissolved. We will get there, but we're going to need a lot of support to do it. As I mentioned, so our, our tribal code reads that and um, in order for a child to be placed in foster in one of our foster homes or in our care for more than 24 hours, they have to be licensed by us. So, and I, I don't know if I mentioned the number, but we have 14 foster homes. So, oh, wow. yeah, and the fact many. that it's not, um, and the fact that there's potentially 863 Indian children on our reservation that are in need of foster homes is, is huge. So we have mm -hmm. to make sure that we have the homes that can care for these children first and foremost. So, of course, we're, we're, we're actively recruiting uh, for foster homes, but um, there, there is, our intent is to have this um, agreement dissolved at, at some point in the future. Awesome. Well, is there anything I've left out? Anything important we should add that people need to know about? Any highlights I've missed that you'd like to leave uh, them with? Any closing thoughts? I don't think so. I appreciate the time uh, that sure. you and the opportunity to come and visit about this. Uh, I know there's been lots of discussion lately. And again, if there is one thing that I can leave you with, it's please, please, um, if you are interested in becoming a foster home, please um, reach out to us. There are other ways that you could help too. If you can't make a commitment to be a full-time foster parent, then maybe you could provide respite for us. Maybe you could um, one weekend a month or one weekend every six months, you'd be willing to be a respite care provider for some of our foster homes so they could take the weekend off. There's a lot, there are a lot of different avenues that we can explore if you're willing to help, but we need you. Um, we need our, all of our citizens to step up and to help us support our children. Well, thank you, Kimmy. That's some really great information. I hope we get a good positive response and we'll just keep pubbing it out there as much as we can. Okay. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. All right. Uh -huh. You take care.
Creek Indians of Oklahoma have powerful ancient traditions, traditions that live on in ceremonies still practiced by some today. One of those traditions, handed down from generation to generation, is the strong will to survive as a people. Nowhere is this strength better reflected than in the condition of the Creek Nation today, a progressive, adaptable tribe facing the challenges of the future with high regard for the ways of the past. Muskogee, or Creek tribe, with a population of more than 30,000, in recent years has distinguished itself as one of the most progressive tribes in Oklahoma. More than a decade ago, Principal Chief Claude Cox and his advisors began identifying the problems faced by Indian people. They set priorities and goals to focus on as the Creek Nation re-emerged as a functioning tribal organization. Finally, after several years of hard work, a new Creek Constitution was ratified by the Creek people on an historic day in 1979, forming a firm foundation for the future of the tribe. But the path leading from the ancient days of tribal power up to that momentous day in 1979 was long and sad. Long before the white man came to this country, the Muscogee people had settled in the southeastern region of North America. By the time these European newcomers began struggling to establish themselves along the eastern seaboard, a powerful Indian confederacy already existed there. The dominant force of this confederacy was the Muscogee tribe, known to the white man as Creeks, because their towns were clustered along the streams and rivers that snaked through the land. The Creeks at first welcomed the early white settlers and even adopted some of their ways. But by the time of the American Revolution in 1776, the power of the Confederacy was diminishing. Georgians were encroaching on the Creek Nation and the tribe was being pressured to turn over great amounts of land through treaties. The Red Stick War of 1813 and 1814 was a further blow to the size and power of the tribe. The United States Army, under the command of General Andrew Jackson, made it clear that further resistance was useless. Finally, the Creeks, along with several other tribes, were totally displaced from their homelands. During the forced migration of 1836, called the Trail of Tears, thousands of Creek people died on the way to their new home, west of the Mississippi River. But once again, the industrious Muscogee people began to build a nation in the unfamiliar land. Old traditions such as the annual Green Corn Festival were carried on, and new institutions like mission schools and churches were started. The will to survive sustained the Creek people and allowed them to adapt to their new home. But the Creeks were soon drawn into another of the white man's conflicts the Civil War. It, in fact, became a civil war among the Creeks. Many of the tribes supported the South, while others maintained loyalty to the Union. At the war's end, the tribe was left broken and divided. 
the determined people of the Creek tribe had to rebuild their nation once again. With a spark of that ancient strength still alive, the Creek nation did survive. A revised form of government with a written constitution and code of laws was established to meet the challenges of the late 1800s. A permanent council house was constructed in Okmulgee, and from that location the affairs of the Creek Nation were administered by representatives elected by the people. But the coming of statehood for Oklahoma in 1907 brought an end to tribal governments, in spite of their many accomplishments. Since then, the Creeks and the other tribes have been mostly ignored. Until 1971, when the Creek people were allowed to hold tribal elections and Claude Cox was elected chief. In the early 70s, <clears throat> we set some priorities. And those were in housing, education, unemployment, and, and health care for the ongoing benefit and, of the Creek people and making this a good, strong Creek nation. The past few years have been good years of growth for the Creeks. More problems are being resolved, and more people are being favorably affected by the programs carried on through the Creek Nation. Even so, Chief Cox pushes on for greater improvements. We must allow the decisions of the Tribal Council to replace decisions by federal courts, and we must unite behind those decisions because they are our own. One characteristic of our people is their, their will to rebuild. Our nation has rebuilt itself countless times in the past. After DeSoto's invasion in 1540, after Andrew Jackson's invasion in 1814, after our removal from our homelands in the South, and after the tragedy of the U.S. Civil War, and after the allotment of our lands, and after the suppression of our tribal government. Each time our people have recovered and have rebuilt, have progressed in the ways we choose for ourselves. The tragedy of suppression of our tribal government has ended. Rebuild our nation is our mutual responsibility. Thank you. Guided by the Creek National Council and other concerned leaders, the Creek people are enjoying greater control over their own lives. The results of programs started in recent years will have impact for generations. The Creek Nation is again strong. Its spirit is firmly rooted in the past, yet its vision is focused on the future. And the will to survive remains a strong tradition of its people.